Good evening, fellow conservatives. Thank you kindly, Erica and John Amirati and Bob and Carrie Zeidman, and the leadership and membership, Joel and your board and volunteers of the Silicon Valley Conservative Forum. Usually they ask you to turn your cell phones off. I say, turn them up. Maybe the government will learn what freedom is all about. <laughs> I'm very honored to be your friend and to return. Uh, your reputation precedes you. Yesterday was 9-11 plus 16, Patriots Day, a day of remembrance and rededication to freedom. I'd like to dedicate my talk tonight to all first responders and veterans and active duty members of the armed forces of the United States. Do we have any vets here tonight? Please stand. Thank you for your service. Back in 1966 and 1967, in his run for governor and then in his thank you tour throughout California, Ronald Reagan expressed heartfelt admiration to his fellow conservatives who keep shining a light of truth and principle in a progressive state. Our shining city on a hill still needs lamp holders. And you've all been doing that. Winning some, losing some, but keeping the faith. I stand with you. In some ways, there's not much new under the sun. Governor Reagan promoted what he called the Creative Society, asking citizens to step up and volunteer and chiding the liberal Maine state for raising taxes too high and for spending too much. Reagan wanted less government and more citizen empowerment over our own lives. He promoted innovation and problem solving, not with more and more laws, regulations, and taxation, but through an industrious and noble spirit of people. When you think about the dollars he was concerned with then, thousands and millions, compared to today when we're talking billions and trillions of unfunded liabilities in this state and this nation, we must regret that the conservative case against big bureaucratic government has come up against a culture and a political system that seems to move ever more strongly and consistently away from the founding principles that Mr. Reagan and all of us assert. Disclaimer, I'm from a small suburb of the Bay Area, Los Angeles, California. <laughs> Particularly bruising little run of baseball we've had. I note uh, my team is up here to join your giants in a little manual festival. The crisis of California is something we all share together. My friend Michael Ramirez produced a political cartoon I have framed in my office. It's a map of California and underneath it just says Greasifornia. Clearly we have a three-part Greek play here. I'm just not sure if it's a comedy or a tragedy. Will Rogers once said when the Okies left Oklahoma and moved to California, it raised the IQ of both states. <laughs> Scene one, California 1.0 was the discovery, the adventure, the building of our magnificent state. A lot of Eureka moments went into becoming the sixth strongest economy in the world and a beacon to those who seek a better life around the world. Empowered by the 19th century gold rush, 20th century California became a top 10 global economy and national leader in agriculture and biotechnology, defense, entertainment, soft manufacturing, information technology, tourism. Entrepreneurs from Europe and Asia and even Brooklyn, New York, brought their passions 
not to mention the aforementioned Giants and Dodgers, to glory time and again. California hosts the USS Ronald W. Reagan aircraft carrier and the sophisticated infrastructure of the Pacific Fleet. The major West Coast ports of Long Beach, LA, and the Bay Area. Orange County's Disneyland. Hollywood Studios, admired beaches. World-class wineries. Silicon Valley's venture capital system. The University of California. And the fruit and salad bowl, the farmer's market of the world in the state's fertile Central Valley region. But California 2.0 has been the fall. The disastrous consequences of big government statism, corrupt politics, and failed statesmanship. California 3.0 is undetermined and in our hands. Once upon a time, Republican elected officials from California led our nation with conservative first principles. The Golden State's first U.S. Senator, John C. Fremont, was Lincoln's pathfinder as the first presidential candidate of the Republican Party in 1856. Ronald Reagan was California's 33rd governor and then the successful two-term 40th president of the United States. Prop 13 and the anti-tax movement were important and long-standing efforts to protect homeowners from the voracious appetites and confiscatory taxation ambitions of local and state governments. Today, California conservatives and Republicans are at a low ebb. Voter registration has the GOP at less than 25%, now in third place behind Democrats and independents. The top two voting system means that GOP candidates don't even appear on the general election ballot for U.S. Senator or Governor. The last time a Republican won a U.S. Senate seat from California was in 1988, Pete Wilson. All current statewide constitutional officers are Democrats, and the state legislature in Sacramento has its two-thirds supermajority. Under Gov Governor Jerry Brown's fourth term, the cumulative cap and tax, cap and trade carbon taxes, the nation's highest gas taxes, high sales and property taxes, auto taxes, corporate taxes, state income and capital gains taxes, and punishing permit, fees, licensure costs, and regulatory burdens and fines are simply crushing hardworking taxpayers and small business people, millions of whom have fled the state. The one-party golden state is in crisis. We rank near the bottom year after year in fourth and eighth grade math and science and reading scores and in high school literacy and graduation rates. We face increasing crime rates due to the Supreme Court rejection of our state prison system and Governor Brown's and voter approved early release of criminals. Our state violates federal law via sanctuary cities. We failed to build dams and we create man-made drought due to environmental extremism. We suffer disproportionately high rates of unemployment in the Inland Empire, including in the rural North State, the state of Jefferson, where regulatory assaults on the local mining, fishing, timber, agriculture, and water rights industries result in societal maladies such as spousal and child abuse. We lead the nation in welfare. Fully one-third of our nation's welfare cases are in California. We pay out billions of dollars a year in union-secured salaries and benefits, obscenely high pension liabilities to public employees, funds therefore unavailable for prisons or child health or road repairs or education. The left indoctrinates our youth and Democrats now organize 16-year-olds to register to vote at the urging of union leaders. The fix is in. 
Sacramento Democrats now want to send you to jail if you use the wrong term vis-a-vis -vis transgendered people. And the state now bans publicly funded travel to eight states. Texas, Alabama, Kentucky, South Dakota, Kansas, Mississippi, North Carolina, and Tennessee. Banned from state travel because of their policies on social issues. General Goldberg is your next speaker. That's liberal fascism. The U.S. Congressional Delegation from California now numbers 14 Republicans out of 53 representatives. LaMalfa, McClintock, Cook, Denham, Valadeo, Nunez, McCarthy, Knight, Royce, Calvert, Warbacher, Issa, Hunter, and Walters. And they're about to face their biggest test yet to remain resolute and stand by the taxpayers of California by saving us from the swamp that is Washington, D.C. The GOP Congressional Majority, via the Tax Writing House Ways and Means Committee, and the Trump Administration are finalizing the long process of legislative sausage making for tax cuts, tax reform, and tax simplification. Many agree in theory with the idea of cutting the corporate tax rate so that we're more competitive with Canada, Europe, Asia, from 35% to 20 or even 15%. Unfortunately, because we were not able to succeed with Obamacare reform and repeal, Congress wants to offset any potential revenue reductions due to corporate tax relief with the usual gambit, socking it to middle class taxpayers like Californians, New Yorkers, and New Jerseyans who live in high tax blue states. The deduction from federal taxes of your state and local taxes adjusts your gross income by about 8% per taxpayer. It has existed since 1913. The Tax Policy Center estimates $1.3 trillion over 10 years would flow from blue state taxpayers to the federal government with the ending of the state and local tax deduction. The Nonpartisan Tax Foundation estimated the federal deduction at $100 billion for California in 2014. Second place was New York, $68 billion. I just told you that not one Republican congressman from California has yet stood up publicly to say, no, I don't want $100 plus billion dollars a year to leave the pockets of California taxpayers to go to the swamp in Washington, D.C. Even Liberal Governor Andrew Cuomo in New York opposes this, as does Rep. Mike Thompson from St. Helena. But not a word from Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy. Does he really want to further build the wealth and the political power and the war chest of high-tech corporate Democrats in Silicon Valley while hammering middle-class taxpayers from the Oregon border to San Diego and the Bay Area, LA, Orange County, and everywhere in between. By the way, California is a net donor state, unlike Mississippi, for example. We spend more to DC than we get back. So the argument that we're being subsidized by the rest of the country for this deduction is flat out wrong. Show us the money, Congressman. And who keeps it? Taxpayers or Washington, D.C.? Taxing Californians, the highest tax citizens in the country, evermore, will be the final blow, resulting in the final exodus of mostly Republican taxpayers via the I-15 in Nevada, from Southern California to Vegas, from the Bay Area to Reno Sparks. Ironically, the GOP Congress may finish off Republicans in California, tipping the most populous state into third world status and destroying the American dream for hardworking taxpayers. Your move, Gang of 14. I wish to catalog 
what I consider to be conservative first principles. There are five. Constitutionalism. Not assured any longer. The head of the Con Law Department at my alma mater, the Georgetown Law Center, has suggested that we have a living constitution and are not bound by the text and traditions of the U.S. Constitution. Number two, economic liberty and prosperity and property rights. Economic liberty and property rights. Personal responsibility under a system of equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. The Protestant work ethic is rooted in biblical principles of the individual being made in God's image. We are co-creators with God, and we are responsible for the betterment of ourselves. Free market democratic capitalism, not crony capitalism a la Solyndra, along the 101, is being vigorously challenged by a renewed socialism agenda. The Democrats produced a candidate in the last election cycle who won 22 state primaries as an avowed socialist. Satellites show lights from Earth at night representing the creative spirit and economic activity that produces universities and hospitals and museums and businesses and ballparks. Do we really need to contrast South Korea with North Korea? The former East Germany with West Germany? Or Miami with Cuba, as JFK would have put it? Since 1790, the average GDP growth rate in the United States approaches 4% a year. The Obama years produced 1.5% per year over eight years, the worst period in American history. Boosting our growth rate to 3 plus percent adds 14 to 20 trillion dollars to our economy over 10 years almost exactly what our current debt is. Number three, freedom of conscience, religion, and speech. Increasingly opposed by campus political correctness, indoctrination, intimidation, and illiberality from Yale to Cal Berkeley. What was done to Chick-fil-A has not left my mind. Democrat politicians in major cities in this country tried to gang up on a private company, which serves everyone with a smile, by the way, merely for the personal political beliefs of the president of the company. That's un-American. So I was done to my friend, a lovely lady who owns the El Coyote Mexican restaurant in LA. And what was done to the head of Firefox, and to the young man at Google. You shouldn't get fired in this country for being a conservative. <laughs> Kirsten Powell's book, How the Left is Killing Free Speech, Kim Strassel's The Intimidation Game, Bernie Goldberg's Bias, Guy Benson, Mary Catherine Ham's book, End of Discussion, all document this vicious assault on free speech in our country. Number four, the defense of freedom. Mr. Obama, of course, never wore the uniform. He called our brave Marines corpsmen. And he was totally unprepared to be commander in chief. He asserted he was a citizen of the world, as did John Kerry in 2004. And he set up a retreat of American leadership in a dangerous world. The Obama doctrine was simple. Hug thugs and offend our friends. The human rights record alone was deplorable. I remember when Mr. Obama refused to accept or read the letter from Lech Walesa and Václav Havel and the dedicated dissidents and freedom fighters who are our partners with President Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Pope John Paul II in Central and Eastern Europe. They asked him not to forsake them as he abandoned missile defense, as it was Mr. Obama, of course, who soft-pedaled the Russians. Governor Romney was correct, by the way, in 2000, 
and 12. A word, by the way, about the Russian hysteria, if I may. Let me see if I have this correct. Not one American has publicly asserted that his or her vote was altered or influenced by alleged Russian hacking of the RNC and the DNC. The DNC happened to have been the weak link, and true actual emails about the corruption of Hillary's team was leaked. Not too many people were surprised to learn that political operatives offer each other nasty rumors and comments about their political frenemies. But now Democrats proclaim there was a conspiracy with Russians and the Trump campaign to do exactly what? Tell the world the Clinton crime family and their associates were awful people? I think we knew that already. It has been curious to see the Democrats so concerned about Russian ambitions, since they weren't so concerned about Mr. Putin when he invaded Crimea, or the Ukraine, or Georgia before that, or when Obama allowed the Russians to come to dominate Syria to the de detriment of our national security, the fight against ISIS, the lives of 500,000 Syrians, or our ally Israel. I kind of remember something called the Cold War. I was there. I got the t-shirt. <laughs> Let me tell you about one prominent Democrat. He's generation's most prominent Democrat. And the original idea of collusion with the Russians regarding an American election. Ted Kennedy, in the early 1980s, proposed to Soviet leader Andropov a trade. Senator Kennedy would lend the Russians a hand in dealing with President Reagan, who called the Russians an evil empire and initiated a military buildup. In return, the Soviet leader would lend the Democratic Party a hand in challenging Mr. Reagan in the 1984 presidential election. The specifics included Senator Kennedy arming the Soviets with explanations regarding nuclear disarmament talks, and then assisting Soviet representatives to achieve and appear on American television. According to Peter Robinson, the historian, Kennedy proved eager to deal with Andropov, the leader of the Soviet Union, the former director of the KGB, and the principal mover in both the crushing of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution and the suppression of the 1968 Prague Spring. When President Reagan chose to confront the Soviet Union, it was Senator Edward Kennedy who chose to offer aid and comfort to General Secretary Andropov. On the Cold War, the greatest issue of his time, the leading Democrat in the country and many other Democrats got it wrong. The Democrats continue to get it wrong. They blocked the State Department from putting Boko Haram, the kidnappers of the Nigerian schoolgirls, from the list of states that sponsor terrorism in order to foster the case that somehow with bin Laden gone, the terror threat was somehow reduced. Mrs. Clinton authored our Libya policy, which essentially overthrew the crazy Muammar Gaddafi at that point, though, an erstwhile U.S. ally, bypassing Congress as usual, Hillary Clinton was the singular American policymaker responsible for turning Libya into a breeding ground for Islamic terror. Under Secretary of State Mr. Kerry, nuclear policy was siphoned off to the U.N. The awful Iran deal empowered the Mullahs, and reformers and dissidents around the world took note America no longer has their back. Mr. Trump, thank God, is seeking to rebuild our military preparedness and troops, our ship, tank, and plane levels, and reorganize our rules of engagement to go after the enemy. Mrs. Clinton called Syria's Assad a reformer. Mr. Trump sent a friendly re reminder or two to Syrian airfields. That was the red line he didn't allow to be crossed. Syrians used chemical weapons against their own people. The Democrats believe in what they call smart power, which is no replacement 
for moral clarity and American military effectiveness. Finally, Obama's assault on Israel has been well documented. The failure to protect Israel at the United Nations, the years-long bullying of Israel, the using illegally American tax dollars to try to defeat the incumbent Israeli Prime Minister, the demonization of Israel, all of this told the Palestinians and other enemies of America that Mr. Obama did not have our allies back. Fifth and finally, the conservative principle of accountable government, the public trust. 2016 was the year of revolt against the elites and failed government and insider corruption, government gone wild. From Brexit to the election of Mr. Trump, we showed the political class who's boss. Six of the eight richest counties in the United States surround Washington, D.C. We don't have public servants. We have pigs at the trough. And they're bankrupting our future, failing to organize reasonable entitlement reform, and I promise you planting the seeds of a debt crisis that's going to change the standard of living of our kids and grandkids. I wish to transparently just tick off what I see as the three controversies now or fissures inside our beloved conservative movement. First, American first economic nationalism, rejection of bad trade deals, offshoring of our manufacturing economy versus the Wall Street Journal which idealistically believes in free trade, as well as hopefully a growth agenda. And so we have a split. It's not new, but it's very pronounced. An economic trade dispute. Number two, the libertarian, socially moderate California libertarian versus the conservative social traditional values set. I personally am a Big Ten conservative. Hopefully we can agree to limit government and reward, incentivize, and support the mediating institutions. This is one of them. Your church is one of them. Your synagogue is one of them. The Rotary Club is one of them. Less government, more us. And number three, I've already referenced, prudence and limited military engagement versus an aggressive nation building and democracy promotion effort. Those are three prominent fissures inside our conservative movement. We will come down with nuance on different sides of those questions. I just thought I would be honest to declare that we are not all completely united right now inside the conservative tent. But hopefully we generally agree, and even across party lines, on two critical subjects. A, countering the jihad, the political and stealth and cultural and actual jihad, by telling the truth about Islamism, Islamic extremism. Like the Arab world is rooted in an honor-shame dynamic. Its men are psychologically immature, and resists the equal rights of women. It achieves honor through the sword, and no land that was ever conquered by Islam can remain outside of the caliphate. When Mr. Obama claimed that the Islamic State was not Islamic, and others proclaimed that Islam is the religion of peace, you need to spend only a few minutes reading the Quran or the Hadith to understand the relevant scholarly consensus within Islam that to this day does not invite reform and argumentation and moderation. Christianity and Judaism did moderate, did moderate to modernity. Islam, not yet. You know of the 30,000 
violent attacks since 9-11, the campaigns of sex slavery and barbarism and terrorism and intimidation and the purposeful policy of lying and deceit and temporary ceasefires and saying one thing in Arabic and another in English to appease the appeasers. London and Manchester and Barcelona and Bali and Boston and Cologne and Nice and Paris and San Bernardino and Orlando and on and on have disgusted people everywhere. But we're still hearing voices of experts talking about workplace violence or lone wolf actors. All of this is inspired and funded by Sunnis and Shiites, gangsters who preach hate of the West in madrasas and mosques around the world. When will it stop? When we win and they stop shouting Oliver Akbar as a celebration of murdering the infidel because the price we exact is way, way too high. Coming to Israel, the knife attack, a family sitting around the Sabbath meal, your entire village should be destroyed. Coming to the United States to murder an American, and your holy sites go down. Once upon a time, a citizen of Rome could walk the streets of the world with impunity, fearless that nothing would happen to him. For if it did, the power and might of the Roman Empire would fall upon the aggressor. Adams and Jefferson built the U.S. Navy to address the scourge of Islamic Barbary pirates. President John Quincy Adams was quite clear-minded about Islamism. Churchill railed against what he called Mohammedism, as he called it. Do we want a hundred years war against an enemy that loves bloodshed and will keep going until it drops dirty bombs on U.S. citizens? Or do we want to wipe out the enemy for a thousand years at its source? How did World War II end? With V.E. and V.J. Day. Not a truce, not a ceasefire, not an interfaith dialogue. <laughs> Victory. We do nobody any favors, including the women and other victims, Muslim women and other victims, when we don't tell the truth about the enemy. It does appear now that we are going to make concerted efforts to crush ISIS with better rules of engagement in the past eight months. And the second subject that I hope we can agree across party lines, chubby dictator number one in North Korea. <laughs> Kim Il-sung was installed by Soviet mass murderer Joseph Stalin in 1948. He reigned for 50 years. He was variously called the great leader, the heavenly leader, and even the sun. A new calendar was introduced, which used 1912, the year he was born, as year one. Like jihadist indoctrination throughout the Arab and Muslim world, children were miseducated to support the dictatorship. Chubby dictator number two, his son, Kim Jong-il, was the center of a similar cult. North Koreans believed he could control the weather. Hundreds of memorial statues dedicated to the Kim stopped the countryside despite devastating famines and systematic poverty. A massive mausoleum outside the Pyongyang, outside Pyongyang houses the embalmed bodies of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. While starving his fellow citizens, Kim Jong-il ordered the country's first underground nuclear test 
in 2006 in violation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Since then, repeated detonations at the same underground test site in North Korea's northeast region and Pyongyang's now consistent launching of ballistic missiles throughout the region indicate North Korea can now reach the USA with nuclear weapons. Chubby dictator number three, our friend Kim Jong-un, was officially declared, you ready? The supreme leader, the chairman of the Workers' Party of Korea, the chairman of the Central Military Commission, the chairman of the State Affairs Commission, supreme commander of the Korean People's Army, and presidium member of the Politburo Standing Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea. Wow. Kim was promoted also to the rank of Marshal of North Korea, consolidating his position as the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces. He's known as the Marshal. He obtained two degrees, one in physics at Kim Il-sung University, how nice, <laughs> and another as an army officer at Kim Il-sung Military University. On 12 December 2013, official North Korean news outlets released reports that due to the alleged treachery, he had ordered the execution of his uncle, He's widely believed also to have ordered the assassination of his brother in Malaysia in February. Bottom line, dude has a legacy of evil on his shoulders. Ambitions to murder and control, blood on his hands, a desire to stay in power no matter what, and likely no escape hatch to avoid prosecution for war crimes. He cannot be negotiated to an honorable conclusion. He won't and can't back down to the West. All of his power and prestige is locked into his position. President Trump's predecessors and China have left him with few options but to deter and preempt the NOCO nuclear threat. China either can see its region in flames and millions flooding into its territory, or it can stand Kim down with grace or with force. We now play the China card. Conservatives, we agree on much. And one thing we agree on is the risks and threats from the left to our beloved nation. Where we believe in the Protestant work ethic, Democrats believe in Euro-style socialism. Where we believe in individual autonomy, the left believes in state authority. We choose natural law and natural rights, inalienable and God-given. The left believes in state-granted rights and the invention of new rights. We believe in liberty rooted in equality, my God is not greater than your God, therefore we're all human beings, and therefore equal, and therefore all deserving of liberty. The Democrats believe in ever-expanding big government, centralization, the welfare state, the bureaucratic administrative state, the redistribution of wealth. We believe in the virtues of religion and family, and the primacy of the individual. Democrats believe in a riskless order, moral relativism, the end of history, postmodernism, the death of God, and race, class, and gender identity politics. We believe in metaphysical ideas, something greater than ourselves. We believe in truths and verities. We believe in nobility and aspiration. We believe in duty and honor. The Democrats believe in interest group liberalism, social justice, nihilism, multiculturalism. There's no objectives in the world. It is all just interpretation. We believe in good and evil. We believe in manly valor. Can you even say that in the Bay Area anymore? 
Democrats believe that the state is our parent. And sadly, it's a lot more than a battle of ideas. The long history of leftist hatred and violence is easy to catalog. James Hodgkinson aspired to win his life as a mass murderer of Republican congressmen, a Donald Trump, and Bernie, Donald Trump hater and Bernie Sanders backer. Like many before him, he was a malevolent man of the hating and hard left. Recall that the murderer of five and shooter of Gabrielle Giffords was a leftist nutcase. How about those Puerto Rican terrorists who attempted to assassinate Harry Truman? Or the Puerto Rican nationalists who entered the visitor's gallery of the house and began firing semi-automatic pistols, five congressmen wounded. How about the murderers of Abraham Lincoln and James Garfield and William McKinley and JFK? All leftists. Attending a service for a South Carolina congressman in the Capitol, President Jackson survived twin misfires of two pistols. Old Hickory used his cane to attack the assailant, who was collared by Congressman David Crockett of Tennessee. Third party candidate for president in 1912, Teddy Roosevelt, was shot in the chest. It hit his thick speech. He said, it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. And he went on giving a speech. The leftist bullet that killed Chicago Mayor Anton Cermak. Leftist. John Hinckley. Sirhan Sirhan. Gunned down Robert F. Kennedy in a Los Angeles kitchen in the Ambassador Hotel. Leftist. Leftist shot George Wallace. Gerald Ford. An attempt. All of this is known, but the chic left produces plays in New York City depicting the assassination of the President of the United States on Broadway, and Kathy Griffin holds up a beheaded president. The left has a strategy, balkanize America into race, class, and gender. I mentioned I'm from uh, Dodger Town. Not so proud right now. On April 15th, not my favorite day, every year on April 15th, is Jackie Robinson Day. Millions of boys and girls around the country are taught and celebrate Jackie Robinson. And every ball player in the nation puts a number 42 on their uniform to honor Jackie Robinson, who broke the color barrier. That's America. And it's a smear to assert anything else. Millions survived and millions didn't. And when the Vietnamese boat people came here without a nickel to their name, did they set up their human rights organizations and left-wing shakedown operations? Without a nickel to their name, not speaking our language, didn't they just go to work and make the American dream? Race. So now everybody needs to virtue signal that they oppose a few ragtag nationalist socialists. Do we really need every Silicon Valley CEO and every media commentator and every rabbi and priest to tell us that they, what, oppose Nazis? 16 million Americans wore the uniform in World War II. I think we get it. We destroyed the Nazis. 
not very brave to come out publicly against the Nazis. We understand. Race, class. I've already touched on the class warfare. The left wants to redistribute, not create wealth. They want us all equal, but poor. And they want us resentful and dependent, not free and creative. And finally, gender. The left strategy to tell us that there's a war on women. There is a war on women. It's being waged by Islamic extremists. I mentioned Boko Haram. Here's a little bit underreported story, mainstream media. How about the Yazidis? A community destroyed by ISIS, girls taken as sex slaves, while the men around them all had their throats cut. The Clinton Foundation continues to raise money from the world of Islamism, where women are not free to work, drive, live, and study as equal human beings. And the liberal mainstream media continues to hide the fact of the rape gangs and human rights abuse throughout Europe, which is collapsing to the jihadi invasion. The Civil War is here, the Second Civil War. It was declared by the progressives against the American way. And as I documented, it can be violent, including against cops and students on campuses. The enemy is now within. He assaults our constitutional principles, our military preparedness, our cultural values, our economic liberty, our spirit of civility, our freedom of speech, and even our willingness and ability to tell the truth. I leave you with this last little bit of extra leftist hypocrisy. The left does not want to punish in any way the illegal entry of residents here now so as not to visit the sins of the parents on the children here in this country illegally. But they're dedicated to tearing down statues in towns across America reflecting historical figures from 150 or 250 years ago. I thought that was quite an interesting juxtaposition. The left's final assault, of course, is on our spirit, our very history, and our borders. They are playing for keeps. Thank you. Silicon Valley conservatives for fighting back. Thank you. Okay, when, uh, one subject that um, comes up not only when you were here, but also when we have other speakers over the years, and uh, there's talks about the progressive and conservative divide. A lot of questions here. So <laughs> we can briefly review. Larry, why are Jews liberal? Did everybody hear the question? <laughs> Why are Jews liberal? So I mentioned I'm a Dodger fan, you're Giants fans. So far not going so good for the Dodgers. In the 1965 World Series, Sandy Koufax was scheduled to pitch for the Dodgers, the star lefty, and it was his religious holiday, Yom Kippur. So he asked his teammate, fellow star, righty, Don Drysdale, to switch places in the starting rotation. And Drysdale said, sure. Koufax was a little surprised that this personal religious observance made him a new patriarch of the Jewish people, but because he was a private, modest man. But in any event, Drysdale took the mound in his place and promptly gave up seven earned runs in two and two-thirds innings. <laughs> But he had a little smile on his face when skipper Walter Austin approached the mound, and as he handed him the ball, Drysdale said, I bet you wish I was Jewish today, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By the way, speaking of baseball and politics, I got baseball on the brain. 
The great Babe Ruth was once asked why his salary was higher than that of the president. And he said, I'm having a better year. <laughs> All right, one more. Tug McGraw, a famous Phillies, sort of crazy pitcher, um, was asked how he spent his World Series check. Well, he said, on wine and women, I guess I wasted the rest. <laughs> the ancient kingdom of Israel. How's that for a transition? <laughs> the ancient kingdom of Israel essentially modeled the balance we have to this day between empire and anarchy. Our Western Judeo-Christian political tradition is built on this moderate middle path. Limited self-government of, by, and for the people. Respect for the equality of human beings. The eternal struggle for freedom within the boundaries of the law, what we call ordered liberty. The settlers of colonial America declared here on our shores a new Zion. They believed they were reenacting the exodus from Egypt. They were familiar with their Bible. Thomas Paine, a Revolutionary War hero, stated that like Genesis, we were beginning the world anew here in the New World. Our founding fathers with names like Benjamin suggested that the escape from tyranny in Egypt be the logo of the new United States. The author of the Bill of Rights, James Madison, had studied the Hebrew scriptures in Hebrew at the College of New Jersey, now called Princeton. President Washington wrote to the Jewish community, small, in Savannah and Newport, essentially declaring, your God is our God. And Abraham Lincoln, our second father, Abraham, believed Americans were, quote, an almost chosen people. The American experience is built on Judeo-Christian civilization and brotherhood and alliance, an alliance of God-fearing law receivers living in freedom and sacred covenant, both at Sinai and in Philadelphia. So why are the Jews of America the most left-wing ethnic group in the country? Briefly, I offer three reasons. The first is sociology. The Democrats welcomed in the immigrant groups in the early 1900s and stitched together a coalition of interest group and ethnic group and struggling poor immigrant communities. And to this day, people are still voting the way their Boba and Zaidi, their grandma and grandpa do. And the Jews are in urban, mostly urban cities, and they build these coalitions with other minorities and urban communities. By the way, even with people who don't like them very much, they stay loyal to that coalition. Sociology. Number two, ideology. The Jews are the most religious people in the world. It's just that a very high percentage of them have dropped Judaism as their religion. <laughs> Norman Podmoritz wrote a whole book about this, and he called it the Torah of liberalism. The belief system, the book, the text, the religion, the Torah, is now liberalism. Synagogues in the Bay Area are the Democratic Party with bagels. <laughs> and Jewish holidays. Yes, we should care for the widow and the poor and the orphan. That has not much to do with big government liberalism and statism. There's some incredible literature. I reference Joseph Lifshitz, who wrote a book describing 
how the Bible itself talks about the importance of not being poor and dependent and begging, but taking care of yourself and then your family and your neighbors and your community. There's a whole literature which explains free market, merit-based, hard work, obligations, creative society, not dependent, poor, big government statism. Yes, we should, by the way, we should, by the way, and we do have a religious obligation to help our neighbor. That has very little to do with taking tax dollars from these people to hand it as free welfare to those people. And number three, I promise this answer will eventually come to a close. <laughs> number three is three, theology. The third reason Jews remain liberal is theology. Here I am very heartfelt. As a small minority, still only five or six million Jews in the United States, and there were five or six million Jews in the United States when we had 150 million Americans. Now we have 320 or 30 or 40, and there's still only five or six million. Liberal secular Jews don't have very many babies. Orthodox Jews, who are more Republican, conservative, pro-Israel, traditionalists, they do have more babies. And so the Jewish vote is moving more conservative, by the way. The coalition of Orthodox families plus Russian and other anti-communist and Persian and Israeli arrivals means the Jewish vote and community has moved somewhat to the right. But for liberal Jews, whose book I told you is liberalism, not the Torah, not the text, not the Bible, what do they all agree on? Fear of the cross, the man, the establishment. They're threatened by, not for completely silly reasons, a Christian majority culture, except that it's rather unfair to apply that to America, which has been the most generous country to all immigrants ever, when it was really European churches 1,800 years ago who beat up Jews as a way to prove the truth of the Christ by the suffering of those who did not accept him. And therefore, theologically, many Jews remain in a stance of opposition. Lastly, and this is my own branded idea, which means it's most inevitably wrong, but no one else can take credit for it. The Jews came into the world as a revolutionary people, challenging the bowing down to many gods and asserting ethical monotheism, the belief in one God for all of us. That subversive act has never left the Jewish mind and soul. Even in a country that is good to the Jews, and good to the Jewish state, where Christians should be thanked for being the only people on the planet who really stand by Israel, the Jews remain subversive and somewhat revolutionary and hostile. I just walked you through how America is built on, in part, Judaism and Judeo-Christian civilization, yet the Jews remain consistently left-wing and subversive. Sorry for the long answer. Okay, that was, uh, well, we covered it all. Well, that was great, Larry. All right, because your talk covers so many um, topics, the, the questions, there's international, there's California, there's the societal, so we'll try to group them together, and if we keep your answers brief, we can get through them all, which would be okay. great. Um, I'll try. The first one was, as a candidate, President Trump indicated his desire, we're going to stay with sort of the uh, Israel theme for a couple of seconds, his desire to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. It looks like that's not going to happen, but do you support this or oppose it, and why? Okay, uh, President Trump said he would like to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. It's currently in Tel Aviv. Do I endorse this? Yes, I do. Why should Israel be the only country in the world which doesn't get to declare its own capital? Yeah, good point. That's great. I know it'll upset some Palestinians. That's not my problem. <laughs> that was great. Okay. <laughs> um, it's the timing and the content. <laughs> And so maybe on the other side of the same coin, are there Americanized Muslims who would stand up to organizations like CARE? Yes. I hope I was, um, I left space for me to declare that Muslim human beings are entitled to the full respect of the law as human beings, 
and Muslim American citizens are co-honored and accepted citizens. They are bound by the Constitution and the laws of this country. And if they pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to our flag and our Constitution and not Sharia law, then I have no problem with them. And Americans have never had a problem with somebody of a different religion. And there's no religious test for office in this country. And shame on anybody who would denigrate or bully or castigate anybody based on their religious belief system. And that includes Muslims. I do have a problem when polls show that many, 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 many Muslims still would endorse Sharia law over the US Constitution or want to import behaviors that are not exactly, how shall I say, rooted in freedom and respect and dignity. In Santa Monica, California, women lawfully walk around with their complete body covered by the burqa. I have a problem with it. I have a problem with it. First of all, it's a, it's a security concern. Yes. Cameras exist at casinos and in ballparks and at gas stations and everywhere else you go so that security can see your face. You hide your face like Antifa does. Maybe you're not up to so much good, so I have a concern about that little behavior. But I do not uh, disallow, I do not discount the idea that Muslims can be good Americans. And staying on the international front, you stated or implied that we need to take out North Korean leadership, ISIS, Boko Haram, etc. Does America really have the stomach and the will and the resources to accomplish this, or do we kind of stay with the, in the category of whack-a-mole, like Vietnam as things come up? Fair question. So when you do dumb things in national security, more bad things start to happen. So Mr. Obama knew the, North, the Iranians had been developing nuclear weapons and centrifuges and capability and was trading with terrorists and Pakistani and other experts in nuclear capability. And for about 10 years, we were debating what? Will the Israelis or the Americans execute regime change in Iran? The Islamic Republic of Iran, still at war with the United States of America. That was the conversation for about 10 years. Under Mr. Obama, the conversation shifted just a wee bit now we send packets, pallets of cash to the mullahs, untraceable, unauthorized by Congress, so they have terrorism money to hand out. Now there are Iranians in Syria, of course in Iraq, killing Americans, and now on Israel's borders, as they play footsie with Hamas, a Sunni group, and the Iranian Shiites are so dedicated to surrounding Israel that they're willing to have coalition with Sunnis, which they hadn't done before. And all that told North Korea something, didn't it? Deterrence means when you act really strongly, then the rats scatter for a while. We've done the exact opposite. We don't need to tell this community what happened in 1938 and appeasement, and I have peace for all time, and I have a peace treaty, and I have a piece of paper. Bad policies will result, result in bad actors doing bad things. So. I don't want to go to war everywhere, all the time, and anywhere. I don't want to go to war at all. And the way you do that is peace through strength. Under President Reagan, my hero, we hardly went to war at all, because enemies got the message. In fact, the Berlin Wall came tumbling down. If we're really strong, maybe the Mueller Wall comes tumbling down. That seems to me to be the only success that we've seen in national security and foreign policy. A resolute America deters and defeats its enemies. A weak America, like a weak Europe, invites aggression. Thank you, a great answer. Thank you. And this is in the... This next question, I think, is timely with so celebrating or commemorating, I should say, the anniversary of 9-11. Would anything or any event bring out current Democrats to support more conservative ideas? I know right after 9-11, there were sort of a trend, but it didn't last very long. Would, does we need something larger, God forbid, than 9-11, or is it a series of other things, or what could move that needle? 
I still hope and think there's a basic common sense and goodwill among the American people. Not everybody's born with a party label or keeps that party label or always prioritizes that party label. I could imagine, as we just saw in Houston and in Florida, neighbor helping neighbor, and you don't ask what party you're part of. There are precincts, of course, where a Republican hardly ever gets a vote, so you actually know what party people are in, and you still help them. So yes, I still have a vision where Americans help Americans, and this, this simmering civil war calms down. And it is most likely to be when we are attacked, when we're infiltrated, when a dirty bomb goes off in LA or San Diego or Houston or Florida or somewhere else, then I think American will help American without regard to party label. I still believe in that, yes. This next question is, is very specific, but I'm also curious, so I'm glad that whoever wrote this wrote it. As a normal, as, me, as a former naval officer, do you have any insights, special insights, into the recent naval ship collisions? Because that is weird, right? That they had, what, several in a... Tired people make mistakes. Yeah. Tired people make mistakes, aren't paying attention, don't go through protocol, don't check off every item on the checklist, miss something, miss a cue, five in the morning, human error. That's my special insight. Yeah. We're not perfect people. Yeah, very sad. Now we have a, a question on domestic U.S. How should we interpret the president's strategy of working with Democrats on the budget and the Harvey funding? Next question, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, there are many, many, many things I like about President Trump, especially his victory over Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. And Neil Gorsuch as the Supreme Court Justice. Mm. What an obviously classy, thoughtful, patriotic person Neil Gorsuch is. I like deregulation and I like exploring energy, clean energy. I like um, the Moab in Afghanistan, and I like attacking the Syrian air base because they use chemical weapons, and I like the changing of the rules of engagement, and I like cleaning out the swamp. There are things I don't like. I don't like the failure to have really resolute conservative principles. I don't like the nasty personal attacks on people, whether it's members of Congress or anybody else. I don't, I don't think you succeed in life by attacking people ad hominem. I do it because these are public figures, but you would never see me in a business negotiation or a friendly crowd and single somebody out and humiliate them. I wouldn't do that. Working with the Democrats on the debt ceiling is a little bit nuanced because this debt ceiling is just an invitation for the media and the Democrats to say, look how mean we are when we care about deficits and debt every time we come up against this arbitrary debt ceiling. I think what the president should have done is merely compromise with Democrats to some commitments. You know what? I did make this compromise, but the Democrats agreed that their caucus would reduce by 1% across the board all federal spending, or something like that. I wish there had been some effort to communicate to the Democrats, to the Republicans, and the American people, we're serious about the debt problem. And so I'm not so thrilled about the way it was done We'll let history judge if it was a good move at the moment of crisis for Houston and Florida. And there are two questions that are somewhat related. I'll express them at the same time. The left has a strategy to, strategy to win. What's our strategy? And the other would be related. Can conservative principles close the fissures that are in the conservative movement right now? Well, one conservative principle that should always be operative is civility amongst ourselves. Ronald Reagan used to say the 11th commandment, right? Don't speak ill of a fellow Republican. And to be sort of generous to each other when we don't agree on every particular issue. Reagan said, I'd rather get 80% of my agenda than be a purist and try to get 100% of it. So I would like to see more civility and friendship among conservatives. One of the problems with the internet, and there are many, is how people anonymously just smear each other and bash each other. I don't like that. 
So I'm not into that at all. You don't see me engaging in Twitter wars and name calling with other conservatives. If I don't agree with someone or I don't like somebody, I'll say that's not my favorite person, but I'm not going to list their bill of particulars. Except for one person, not a big Chris Christie fan. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll leave it at that. Um, the other part of the question was? How do we win? It seems like the left has a strategy and we're fumbling. So we all know how we win. It's all about education. It's all about education. I reference you to Prager University. Are you fans? Mm -hmm. So Dennis is my personal best friend and my mentor over all these decades. Look what he's done. He reached the top as a lecturer and as an author and as a radio talk show host and now is the number one conservative educational website in the world. That's quite a four base home run to achieve in your life. Prager University, five minute videos on every subject in the world with a conservative, thoughtful, friendly, short, pithy uh, message. And it's winning hearts and minds all over the country and all over the world. So I reference Prager University and I think education is the way we win. Yes. And someone has a more of a philosophical question. We'll read it verbatim. When my liberal friends complain about Trump and Putin, I respond that for the better part of 70 years, the USSR expressly supported the Democratic Party and Democrats over the GOP. Is it appropriate or immature to invoke this comparison to something that happened or stopped happening 25 years ago? No, I did it myself. Yes. You all heard me castigate the Democrats. They were the anti anti-communists. But they were worse. Ted Kennedy was a uh, collusionist, collaborationist, in cahoots with <laughs> Andropov. And I got beat up pretty good by the left over a lot of years for being an anti-communist. And so did you. So I don't think there's any problem with that. I still remind Democrats they're the party of the KKK. <laughs> If they want to tear down statues of Civil War era heroes, then we ought to tear down the name Democratic Party. <laughs> the party that stood against civil rights in the 1860s, and the party that stood against civil rights in the 1960s. So, no. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to start a California block. Some questions here. Is there any chance to stop California from becoming a sanctuary state? <laughs> So Reagan is um, often remembered, along with many others, as the happy warrior in politics and the optimist. I think a fair person would read my remarks tonight as concerned. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I do want to be optimistic and Reagan-esque. And I do try to find areas of hope. I just referenced Prager U and all the good work it's doing. And I try to battle with solutions and ideas so that we're effective and not just screaming at the television or the wall or the internet. But am I encouraged by California? No, I'm not. Demographically, I think we're in big trouble. We're under 25% now, registered Republicans, which is the only party that conservatives can join. I guess there maybe are libertarians or freedom movements, but um, so many millions of us have already left do any of you have a friend who's left California? Okay, wow. That's interesting for me to look out and see that. So demographically, we're in big trouble. And of course, the Democrats had a game plan all along. You know that, right? Import millions of people who are dependent on government and will reward them with votes for welfare. They had a game plan. And they took over the most populous state in the Union. Can we win California back? We tried. We had a Republican governor. Anybody remember Arnold Schwarzenegger? It was, it was even in this century. It wasn't all that long ago. Arnold Schwarzenegger. I met the man 15 times. I was on the executive committee of the California Republican Party. I ran the Jewish Republican Club group organization in the state. I did lots of things. He never remembered my name. <laughs> Not a natural born politician. A natural born actor. 
pretending to be a Republican and a conservative, and we all paid the price for it. So is there a knight in shining armor, a lady or a gentleman? Then Meg Whitman spent $180 million trying to be governor of this state. And the very effective communicator, Carly, yeah. Fiorina ran for U.S. Senate, and they both lost by double digits. And that was the moment when I said, I understand, we're in trouble, big trouble. Jerry Brown laughed the whole way through his election campaigns. He knew he was never in trouble. Democrats in safe seats, safe seats, lay low. And if the Republican raises a lot of money, and gets close in the polls, they know like that they can get $3 million from the public employee unions to wipe out the Republican with a hit piece, or 10 of them, at the last minute. Very, very, very difficult state now for the GOP and for conservatives. So I hope to return one day when I have exciting good news about the conservative comeback uh, in California. That's, yeah. Well, that's a perfect segue. I'm going to use moderator in prerogative here and ask the next to the last question because the, there's one more after this. Um, Larry, you're very, very involved and have been for a long time within Republican circles and political circles. Everyone likes predictions. So 2018 is coming up. 2020 after that, would you have any predictions about presidential candidates, primaries, the House, the Senate? I do predict there will be elections in 2018 and 2020. <laughs> in 2020, because they never fail to amaze me, and this is our best special secret weapon, the Democrats are going to nominate Al Franken and the Socialist Green Party Jill Stein so that they can run Frankenstein. Yeah. Thank you. There were some boos in the audience. <laughs> Please tip your cocktail waitresses. Um, 2018 is up for grabs. I don't think it's going to be a bloodbath, and they normally are very difficult for the incumbent party, right? Especially the six-year itch, should Mr. Trump win re-election, the midterms after that are supposed to be very difficult. But even the midterms after a new president, it's supposed to be tough on the party in power. The Senate, as everybody knows, lines up with mostly Democrats having to run for re-election. They have to hold seats, including some seats in states that Mr. Trump won. So you may see Heidi Heitkamp from North Dakota and Joe Manchin from West Virginia uh, and Mr. Donnelly from Indiana um, side with moderate policies and the Republicans on occasion. Um, the House, I think, is more at play because it's really close to the people, and the people remain really upset. Yeah. Okay, well, the, uh, someone wrote it correctly. Your speech was excellent. Thank you. And would you be willing to share a transcript of it? And if so, how would you get it? And I have a comment on that in a second. But either way, thank you, and thank you for everything you're doing. But before I wrote that, uh, Larry's speech will be available on YouTube via the forum, and those of you who are members know how to do that. But again, let's say, again, thank you for everything you're doing. If you Facebook me, and you send me a message along with the friend request, I would be so glad to be your friend in return. Thank you very much.